Good evening and welcome everyone to this evening's webinar entitled Yale Researchers Report on the Study of the Efficacy of the ALCAT Test for Patients with IBS. We appreciate that everyone is taking their time away from their busy schedules to join us this evening. Our speaker today is Dr. Wajahat Mahal. Dr. Mahal is a gastroenterologist and immunologist who received his medical degree and his DPhil in immunology from Oxford University in England. Dr. Mahal did his fellowship and residency at Yale School of Medicine, where he is a full professor and very involved in several of Yale's programs, such as the Digestive Disease Program, Hepatology, Metabolic Health, and Weight Loss. Dr. Mahal became interested in studying the ALCAT test through his colleague, Dr. Dr. Ather Ali, after Dr. Ali conducted an NIH-funded study that surveyed healthcare practitioners about their use of unconventional medical tests and found that many practitioners reported positive outcomes using the ALCAT test. This presentation was studied, was recorded earlier this week at Dr. Mahal's lab, and Dr. Mahal is with us this evening live for questions and answers that will immediately follow. Um, any questions that we don't get to answer tonight can be addressed later on. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to take you through um, some of the background and the findings of this study. Um, the, this presentation is in memory of Dr. Athar Ali. Um, who was a key driver for this project. So as an introduction, um, irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, this is a functional disorder um, of the gastrointestinal tract, and it's characterized by chronic abdominal pain and altered bowel habits. In the United States, um, perhaps between 8 to 20 percent of the population meets the diagnostic criteria, and IBS accounts for 25 to 50 percent of all referrals to gastroenterologists. So this is a very common condition. Um, because it's common, IBS is associated with an estimated $1.5 billion of annual cost, direct and indirect, um, and the majority of patients, interestingly, report food-related symptoms, which was uh, one reason why we obviously wanted to study the effects of food and diet on IBS. Um, the epidemiology is, as I've said before, that in North America, approximately 10 to 15 percent. There's a female predominance. Um, and the prevalence of IBS was 25 percent lower in those aged over 50 um, than uh, as compared to those um, below 50. So the diagnosis of IBS is based or suspected in patients with chronic abdominal pain and altered bowel habits. Um, the most widely used diagnostic criteria is the Rome 4 criteria. Um, and by this set of criteria, IBS is defined as recurrent abdominal pain, on average occurring at least one day per week, in the last three months and is associated with two or more of the following criteria. The pain is related to defec defecation, um, is associated with a change in stool frequency, and is associated with a change in stool form or appearance. Um, there is a um, sort of a qualitative uh, scale that's used um, with sort of type 1 being very hard stool and then at the other end of the spectrum type 7 basically being watery stool. Um, and, and, and that way patients can um, gauge and quantify whether they've had a change in their um, stool characteristics. Um, IBS also has within itself certain subtypes. Um, some patients have IBS predominantly with constipation, um, and these patients report abnormal bowel movements and usually uh, constipation and type 1 or type 2 types of stool. Um, other patients have IBS predominantly with diarrhea, and some patients have a very mixed form of disease and a few patients don't easily fall into any of these categories. So current therapies for IBS are very broad. They fall into dietary modifications, physical activity, and then adjunctive pharmacological therapies. The dietary modifications are mostly trying to identify which food items um, are exacerbating the disease. So typically there's an attempt to exclude gas-producing foods. Um, these are things like beans and onions and celery and also to try and exclude or minimize alcohol and caffeine. Um, avoid lactose-containing foods, and then try and eat foods with low fermentable um, capacity, so oligo dye, monosaccharides, and polyols, so the food map diet. Avoid gluten in IBS, um, D or diarrheal type disease, 
and then the, the flip side would be to use fiber in patients with IBS of a more constipating um, characteristic. Within this world of trying multiple different things, um, some of which is actually quite um, empiric and, and definitely hit and miss, um, there are some commercial food intolerance tests. Um, and these tests will um, try and individually identify which food items will um, improve um, patient symptoms. The data on these is that up till now they've been predominantly anecdotal um, and, and unvalidated. The adjunctive pharmacological therapy is that the treatment should be based on the predominant symptom type, and this is really a symptom relief approach, um, and make incremental changes in therapy at two to four week intervals. So for IBS constipation, not surprisingly, osmotic lax laxatives, uh, polyethylene glycol, um, has been suggested um, and is actually recommended at some level by the AGA or the American Gastro Gastroenterological Association. Um, but keeping in mind that the evidence for this is low quality evidence in terms of the clinical trial quality of data. And then a number of other uh, medications such as long-acting chlor chloride channel activators, again moderate to low quality evidence, um, and then uh, guanylate cyclase agonists to stimulate intestinal fluid secretion and serotonin receptor agonists. For IBSD, antidiarrheal agents um, are often the first line therapy, not surprisingly. So loperamide, um, again, for AGA recommended, but very low quality evidence. Um, bile acid sequestrants, um, cholestyramine, for example, um, and then serotonin antagonists. Um, other symptomatic, therapy t symptomatic therapies that could be used are antispasmodic agents, um, antidepressants, um, and antibiotics, all with either low or moderate quality evidence, as well as probiotics. So going into the actual study, the title of the study is Efficacy of Individualized Diets in Patients with Irritable Bowel Syndrome, a Randomized Controlled Trial. And the trial design uh, was very rigorous, so this was a parallel group, double-blind, randomized, one-to-one -one controlled trial. The inclusion criteria were in adults between the ages of 18 and 75 years meeting Rome 3 criteria, um, and also concurrent IBS medication, as long as the dosing was stable for 30 days prior to enrollment. The exclusion criteria were um, a history of other organic um, intestinal disease, particularly inflammatory bowel disease, significant abdominal surgeries, radiation proctitis, um, recent antibiotic use, um, and significant um, uh, dietary changes in the last few weeks. Um, in the trial design prior to initiation, the primary outcome was identified as a difference between groups in the global improvement scale, which is a scale used to um, quantify IBS symptoms. Secondary items were three additional scales. Uh, one was a symptom, symptom severity scale, one was adequate rely scale, and the third was a quality of life scores. The sample size of 46 participants was calculated with 80% power to detect group differences of 1.1 in the GIS scale. Um, the test that was used um, to personalize the diets was a leukocyte activation test. For this, peripheral venous blood was collected in sodium citrated tubes and was sent to cell science systems in Florida um, for testing. Um, there, the leukocytes were separated from whole blood using a density gradient. Um, neutral buffer and autologous plasma were added back into the cells, um, and 200 separate um, individual food samples or extracts were individually tested with the peripheral blood leukocytes. Um, and then the cell count readouts were performed using electric sensing zone method. The results from this test for each of the 200 tubes were reported either as positive meaning that a severe or moderate reaction was identified in the test, or negative, meaning that a mild or no reaction was identified. An additional analysis was performed in a subgroup, um, and this analysis was an aptima-based proteomic analysis from the plasma. And aptimers are a synthesized and constructed sequence of nucleic acids, which are designed to bind to specific um, biomarkers and allow detection of those biomarkers in, a, in a biological samples. So it's essentially it's a powerful discovery tool, um, and the power lies in the fact that in a small volume, such as 65 microliters, between 1,300 and 5,000 individual proteins can be identified and quantified. Um, from this uh, patient population, 
Six individuals who were strong responders were identified, and plasma prior to um, uh, the uh, removal of um, um, a positive food item and after removal of the positive food item was then subsequently analyzed by this Aptima-based test, um, and this was done by sending the samples to Somologic. So the diet assignments um, were as follows. There were two groups. Um, the experimental group or the intervention group ha were given individualized diets consistent um, with the uh, leukocyte test, um, and the patients were instructed to avoid positive foods for four weeks. They were allowed to consume mild foods every fourth day and negative foods um, as they wished. Um, and again, keeping uh, just to make the point that the patients didn't know um, whether the foods they were asked to avoid were positive or negative, and the, and the staff member uh, instructing them also didn't know, so this was entirely double-blinded. The control of the comparison group um, were also instructed to avoid foods for four weeks, but these were foods that had been identified as negative um, based on the um, leukocyte test. And they were allowed to consume mild foods as well as positive foods as they wished. So going into this, the null hypothesis was that the assumption was there would be no difference between the two groups, um, which was what one would expect if the leukocyte test was not providing any um, specific information. The results are as follows. So in this flow diagram, you'll see that um, 126 individuals were assessed for eligibility. 68 were excluded um, because they didn't meet inclusion criteria. Um, 13 declined to participate, 9 for some other reasons. In total of 58 were randomized, 29 into each arm. Um, and then the rest of that you can see there that uh, 29 were randomized, at four weeks uh, point um, that on the allocation side, um, four had discontinued. Um, on the comparison side, none had discontinued. And finally, for analysis, we had 26 on the intervention side and 29 on the comparison side. The demographics of the two populations were as follows. They were um, essentially identical age. Uh, female predominance was identical. Um, uh, 97 percent were, 97 and 86 percent were Caucasian, and as we go through the rest of the data set, they were very well matched. Um, looking at the foods that were most frequently restricted, um, we can see that, and I'll just run through the names on the left side, so strawberry, cinnamon, almonds, apple, onions, pear, buckwheat, chickpea, um, were all restricted at approximately 19 to 26 percent. Um, and a number of them, particularly almonds, apples, onions, and pears, are part of the high food map diet, but the vast majority are not part of the high food map diet. And, and, and uh, patients, if they had been following the high food map diet, would have continued to consume these. So as I mentioned earlier, the primary outcomes were to examine the IBS uh, global improvement scale before um, restricting foods and after restric restricting foods. And the secondary outcomes were three additional um, scales. One was the symptom severity scale, one was the adequate relief scale, and one was the quality of life. So in the treatment outcomes, um, these are sort of numerical data, um, just as a reference, but then in the next slide I'll show you what was actually found. So the global improvement scale, which was a primary outcome, showed that the individuals in whom um, there was an intervention, meaning they had been asked to um, not eat food items which had given a positive reading actually had a much better global improvement scale um, as compared to the comparators. Uh, the comparators are in red. Um, so this was significant at four weeks and it was even more significant at eight weeks at 0 0.02 p-value. The symptom severity scale also showed um, significance at four weeks and um, at eight weeks at a value of 0 0.03. And the adequate relief and the quality of life, both of which were secondary outcomes, um, did not show a significant difference between the two populations. The Aptima data um, is as follows. So there was paired analysis of tw 12 samples. So these were from six individuals. Um, six samples were taken pre-food um, restriction and six post-food restriction. All of these six individuals were in the intervention group. So from the plasma of these individuals at pre and post times, uh, uh, 1,128 proteins were analyzed. 87 of them were significantly different um, at a p-value of uh, less than 0 
between four weeks and the baseline samples. Um, however, since so many um, proteins were assayed to correct for the multiple analysis, these data were analyzed using a, an appropriate correction. And following the appropriate correction, a single uh, pre-post difference uh, remained significant. And this was in neutrophil elastase, uh, which was reduced in individuals who had a strong response. So <clears throat> the strengths of the study are uh, that um, by design it was adequately powered. It was uh, entirely randomized um, with a matched comparison diet. It was rigorously blinded. Um, the subjects as well as the staff were blinded as to whether they were um, uh, guiding on removing a positive food item or a negative food item. The outcome measures are validated by other studies um, and there was a high level of dietary adherence and minimal dropout. Um, and also the analysis was performed in an, in an intention to treat manner. The limitations are that ethnically the, the population was very homogeneous and, uh, and, and uh, almost entirely Caucasian. Um, the intervention was relatively short um, at four weeks. However, um, since the findings are positive, this is somewhat less of a uh, limitation. Um, and other factors that can affect IBS were not accounted for. Um, and obviously there are many of such factors such as changes in the gut microbiota or psychological stress or travel. However, although they were not accounted for, they were controlled for because there was a control group um, in the study. So the overall conclusions from these data are that the leukocyte activation test um, can be used to develop an individualized diet that can alleviate symptom burden in IBS. These dietary changes may be less restrictive than a low food map diet. Um, and hence may result in better long-term adherence. And importantly, keep in mind that um, uh, as with all complex, complex clinical studies, future studies ideally multi-site with larger sample size to confirm these results and in particular to confirm them with other dietary interventions um, would, uh, would be um, the ideal way to proceed from now. Um, that's my last uh, summary slide, and again, I'd like to finish uh, with just uh, reminding everybody that this presentation is in memory of Dr. Arthur Ali, who was the prime driver for this. Thank you so much. So, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to take you through um, some of the background and the final. Director of Nutrition Services for Previ Medica, and ha I'm happy to be here with you this evening. We did get a lot of questions, and that's very exciting uh, because that shows a lot of interest. Um, first question for you, Dr. Mahal. Uh, with regard to the neutrophil elastase, could you go a little bit more into that and explain what that is for the people who are on the webinar this evening and who are not familiar with that? and uh, what the significance of the drop in the neutrophil elastase was among the strong responders, and, and did that surprise you? Sure, sure, I'll be happy to. So, you know, neutrophils are a, um, uh, a form of innate immune cell which uh, uh, becomes activated by a number of stimuli, and when they're activated, they release a number of enzymes, of which elastase is one of them, but they release many, many different enzymes. And these enzymes function to um, trap bacteria, kill bacteria, but they can also cause damage to tissues. So like a lot of um, sort of attack molecules, they're not entirely specific for bacteria. They can cause self-damage. So the fact that neutrophil elastase um, was reduced um, would be certainly consistent with less tissue damage after removal of positive food items, which obviously is something that we would all like to see. Um, and um, in some studies which have actually biopsied um, intestinal tissue in patients with IBS, they have found increased numbers of neutrophil, neutrophils, again, consistent with the fact that in IBS that there is a, a, a genuine inflammation occurring. So the tissue biopsy studies show increased neutrophils in the intestines, and these tests show decrease in neutrophil elastase in the peripheral blood. Um, so admittedly, different studies done at different times in different patients um, but one way to um, put them together would be that um, um, that by removing the positive food items, that there is less intestinal neutrophil infiltration, um, activation, and release of neutrophil elastase. But that's putting together data from two or three different studies, um, and that's you know that's, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, do your findings have implications for other inflammatory disorders of the gut, such as 
inflammatory bowel disease or celiac disease or, or even um, eosinophilic esophagitis? So possibly. Uh, the etiology of irritable bowel disease is not known. Uh, one possibility is that there is um, increased permeability in the gut. So if we imagine that for some unknown reason that, that I, mean, not, I mean, there is increased permeability, but if we say that we don't currently understand what it's due to, but the increased permeability will result in potentially um, greater amounts of food antigens getting inside um, the gut epithelium and then activating immune cells, uh, which then can result in inflammation and cause tissue damage. Um, and the reason I mentioned increased permeability is that that's a common feature of a number of conditions, including inflammatory bowel disease and celiac disease, um, and possibly even eosinophilic esophagitis. So all of these conditions could have increased permeability as a common feature, resulting in um, increased amounts of food getting into the body in an unprocessed way and then causing immune cell activation. Okay. Uh, in your presentation, you, you mentioned that the ALCAT test measures peripheral leukocytes. Uh, could you explain a bit more about the, the ALCAT test, actually how it works, and, and how it might be different from antibody testing? Sure. So, um, I mean, the ALCAT test clearly is a cell-based test. So, in fact, once the blood sample is obtained, um, the, it is, the, you know, the samples and the cells are washed such that one is left with the cells and in fact the immunoglobulins are in fact removed from the ICE system. So that part is clear. This, this has nothing to do with measuring antibodies or an antibody mediated test. It's an immune cell based test. Um, now when immune cells undergo activation through a variety of mechanisms, um, obviously many, many things change in them. And one of the things that changes is their size. Um, they become larger. Um, sort of become a, roughly 1.5 to 1.7 times larger than their resting state. And that affects a number of things, including the conductance through the cell. Um, and so the ALCAT test is measuring a, a combination of changes in um, immune cells related to change in size and conductance with activation. Yeah. If I may, I just want to clarify one point there. Um, the, the, when the ALCAT test is performed, the autologous plasma is still present in the sample. So whether an antibody is involved in the process or not, it, it would still result in, in, as an endpoint in changes in, in cell size, number, morphology, activation or, or non-activation. Okay. Um, Dr. Mahal, were there other biomarkers or pathways that, um, you, that you saw to be associated with a, a positive reaction to food, to the foods or, or multiple foods? Right. So the, uh, you know, the, um, the proteomic aspect, aspect was a discovery approach, which means that we, in a very unbiased way, actually assayed uh, 1,128 proteins using an aptamased uh, proteomic assay. Um, this was done externally to our, from our lab by a uh, somologic company. Um, and we actually found uh, a total of 87 um, separate proteins that reach significance at a p-value of 0.05. Um, however, of course, when one does multiple tests, purely statistically, one could find, um, or purely by chance, one could find statistical associations. Um, so a number of um, statistical corrections have to be made, um, which after they were made, we were left with neutrophil elastase. However, we have to keep in mind that the sample size was extremely small. Um, you know, there were essentially six individuals with six pre and six post samples. Um, and it will be very interesting to see if these um, preliminary results with 87 hits, if any of them, um, once the sample size was a more reasonable sample, um, would, could be confirmed. Okay. Uh, does your data suggest that an individualized approach can be uh, combined with a more generalized approach, such as one uh, within a, a FODMAP plan, a low FODMAP plan? So, you know, the data supports, clearly supports that removal of positive food items results in symptomatic improvement. So that part is clear. Um, the study wasn't designed to combine removal of food item, positive food items with an additional dietary manipulation. Um, it would be reasonable to conclude that it would be helpful um, because, you know, if, if there are two separate things that are helpful and one combines them, the, as, a clinical, as a clinician, um, it would be reasonable to assume that there would be 
increasingly beneficial in combination. However, the study design doesn't actually allow us to directly address that. But um, um, in general, seeing these patients, I would expect it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you think that following a personalized eating pattern like the one that was formulated from uh, the ALCAT results would possibly change the microbiota? Um, so the microbiota is sensitive to um, all sorts of environmental changes, um, and certainly dietary changes is extremely sensitive. So I think uh, the, the simple answer is yes. I would expect to see a change in the microbiota. Um, the question in my mind would be that any changes that are seen, are they greater than would be expected by randomly changing food intake of a particular item, right? So are there specific changes, um, you know, presumably or most interestingly in the beneficial direction by removing a pos alcat positively identified food item um, that are different from removing either a negative or some random food item. So I think there will be definitely be changes, um, but uh, uh, the real answer of what that means would probably would be more complex than other changes. I think could be how do the changes related to removing a food item compare with removing a random item or removing a negative item. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you think that irritable bowel syndrome has links to other disorders? So, um, meaning could it possibly signal other um, inflammatory disease processes that are occurring that really have not gotten to the point where it's diagnosable? Sure. So, I mean, this area is, um, you know, under active investigation, so there are no absolute um, conclusive associations, but, you know, people have studied in large databases, patients with irritable bowel, um, compared them with a control group in the same database without irritable bowel, and then examined to see if the group with irritable bowel has additional disease associations. Um, and a number of studies have found increased disease associations, including, you know, particularly celiac disease, um, inflammatory bowel disease, and colon cancer in those statistical sort of associations. So there's certainly data out there suggesting that patients with IBS have um, increased prevalence of other organic um, GI diseases. Um, the data isn't at the level where these associations have been consistently found in every study to the point of being um, widely acceptable, but there's certainly very strong hints there. Okay. Um do you have um, a further interest in studying other aspects of, of, of the ALCAT test? So I think so. I think, you know, these results are so encouraging. Um, and again, we have to recall that, you know, we went into this. And by we, I have to say that, you know, the, uh, the other senior author, Dr. Arthur Ali, was really somebody who initiated this um, and was the clinician predominantly who ran this. And I was providing laboratory support. So uh, we must uh, remember Dr. Arthur's contribution to all of this. Um, but, you know, uh, Dr. Ali and I really went into this um, with what would be called the null hypothesis that, you know, we didn't have any um, strong presumption or bias um, which way the results would go. Um, and um, frankly, you know, the expectation and null hypothesis approach is that one would not see any difference in the two groups, the groups that had a positive food removed and the groups that had you know, the negative food removed. And so we were very pleasantly surprised to find, you know, um, the results that are clearly, um, clearly show that in this study, which was very carefully randomized, blinded, double blinded, um, that removal of positive um, ALCAT test foods resulted in significant improvement in IBS. So, you know, the reason I'm going into that is that, you know, having walked into this in an entirely neutral way, now we're in a different place because we have positive data. So that's clearly very stimulating um, and, you know, raises lots of questions about other uh, disease states that are food related um, where the ALCAT test might be helpful. Um, you know, one obvious thing, I have, I run a, a weight loss program. So one obvious question would be whether removal of, you know, positive ALCAT test foods um, can improve inflammation in people with obesity because it's really the inflammation that does damage in individuals who are obese. Um, damage to the liver, damage to other organs. Um, we know how difficult it is to lose weight. Um, and it's not clear that the weight loss is the crucial feature um, that needs to be improved. It's really removal of the inflammation. So I think it'd be fascinating to test if in people with a BMI of greater than 30, if removal of positive food items 
can result in redu reduced inflammation, um, irrespective of whether they do or don't lose weight. Can I, um, speaking of inflammation, Dr. Mahal, we know that you um, authored a very interesting paper in Scientific American a couple of years ago entitled Cells on Fire. And it was a very, very clear explanation about inflammatory processes that occur in cells and uh, clearly elucidated the steps of the inflammasome. And I'm wondering if, if you see or at this moment can speculate on any connections between the gross cellular changes that are observed through this um, rapid clinical scan we call the LCAT test and other inflammatory pathways that you're familiar with through your work? Um, so certainly, I think, you know, the similarities with the inflammasome would be that the ALCAT, most of the cells in the ALCAT test would be innate immune cells. Um, and those are the cells in which inflammasome activation is predominantly active. So there's a general overlap in terms of we're speaking about likely the same cell population. Um, and then also uh, many non-specific stimuli can activate the inflammasome. Um, and, you know, and food antigens may be a form of non-specific stimulus as well. So I think there are a number of um, overlaps. It could actually be interestingly tested. Uh, what I mean by that is that it would be quite possible to use, to perform the ALCAT test as you normally do, and then also perform an identical test, but in the presence of an inflammasome inhibitor. There are specific chemicals that inhibit the inflammasome. And if, if you were to find that by including an inflammasome inhibitor, something like a caspase one inhibitor, for example, that the, you know, the reactivity of the ALCAT test was reduced, that would be direct evidence that I, in fact, the ALCAT test and the inflammasome activation pathway was sort of one and the same. And, and <clears throat> would you say that the same holds true with other inflammatory pathways aside from the inflammasome activation? Uh, you know, potentially, but it would have to be tested. Uh, I mean, there are a number of inflammatory pathways, um, the various kinases that are required for inflammation. So, you know, one could certainly design up an experimental plan where individual or each of the major inflammatory pathways is inhibited individually to try and get to the bottom of which one might be um, most relevant for the, the reactivity in the ALCAT test that you're seeing. Are there some other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, we did get quite a few other questions that a lot of them had to do with individual situations and symptoms that they're experiencing and their loved ones and so forth and specific questions about the ALCAT test and the degrees of reactivity and so forth. And we want to assure everyone we will definitely address them all. Um, but we think it's best to address them individually. Uh, we did get a lot of questions uh, regarding celiac disease. So I'm wondering if um, maybe this, this one question actually just came in. Uh, do you have a, a sense of what, about what percentage of patients with long-term well-controlled celiac disease uh, still actually present with IBSD? I would have to look that up. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, um, both celiac and IBS have obviously the predominant GI symptoms. Um, and in general, once celiac disease is diagnosed, um, the symptoms tend to be attributable to, to the celiac disease um, because you know, there are strong diagnostic tests for celiac disease, uh, whereas you know, IBS tends to be much more of a functional diagnosis. Um, so I think it's, it's difficult. Um, it's just sort of the bias that people have is that if you have a strong diagnostic test and you can sort of get a handle on the disease, that tends to be the predominant disease that one deals with. So I, I don't have the data to give you mm -hmm. a, a okay. miracle answer to that. All right. Is it, is it reasonable to think that um, an early um, step in the disease process that leads to celiac in patients that are susceptible um, would be activation of innate immune cellular responses? So potentially, I mean, your celiac disease, um, you know, clearly is a very specific immune reaction um, against, um, you know, protein components in wheat and such like. So that certainly exists. Um, and that can cause epithelial, it does cause epithelial damage, uh, particularly in the small bowel. Um, however, following that, um, there could be additional levels of injury 
for example, by by following um, you know, decrease in um, or increase in gut permeability, there may be additional entry of food antigens completely separate from gliadin, um, which are causing additional levels of symptomatic worsening. Um, so, you know, when the system is damaged in one way, um, it can certainly expose it to additional types of damage in multiple other ways. Um, so, um, you know, celiac disease is a well-defined, you know, immunological um, disease entity, but there may be role for additional levels of food um, you know, intolerances on top of the well-known um, celiac disease food intolerance. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, I think mm -hmm. there are a number of questions that we didn't get answered today, and some of those are personal, and those people will be able to get access to our um, dietitians to address those questions. And certainly, Dr. Mahal, if we get more questions for you, we'll pass them on if you have time sure, to. I'll be happy to answer them by email. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Have a good evening. Same you to as you. Well. Thank you.